Hello everyone, this is Matt Hoots here with Sawhorse, and if you guys follow my channel, you notice that I do a lot of videos recently on ventilation. Ventilation is very important, is you know part of building tight, ventilate right. So we're kind of exploring both aspects, you know, how you create a tight building envelope, but also how you ventilate correctly. Now Corbett Lunsford, and I was talking to him yesterday, he was at one of our projects. We're doing some testing for an experiment that you'll see here in the near future. Um, on the building envelope. Well, he ran into somebody at the 2022 National Home Performance Conference who's talking about balanced ventilation, but also reactive ventilation. So uh, a lot of times we have dumb equipment, basically a fan that's on or off. It's, it's binary. It's like either one or zero. Now you've got these sensors you can put into houses and with these sensors, it lets the fan know to come on. It also lets the HVAC know that uh, you need fresh air inside the house. So basically it takes the equipment that you already have and makes it smarter. So the equipment that we have right now is not that smart. And I've seen a lot of improvement over the last two years with lots of our other product partners that we talk, talk to. And it's neat to see that you have some equipment that can work with other, basically all the products out there. So let's, let's let uh, Corbett now, again, this is Corbett um, using an infrared camera. So that's, that's why it looks like that. That's not how it usually looks. Um, and he's going to talk to this vendor at the National Home Performance Conference. At the Air Cycler booth with Jason Wolfson, who has been developing uh, controls, and the controls are taking a next level step to help us get more customized on our home performance, right? Right, we're introducing the third generation in our long line of uh, innovative low-cost ventilation controls. We're now connecting to the web. So for example, if you gave me your zip code, um, I can go out and find out what the temperature is outside your house or the relative humidity or from one of the EPA websites what the air quality out of your home is and if you'd like to adjust the ventilation rates or inhibit ventilation if there's bad air like a wildfire or uh, too hot or too humid um, you download our app connect to our uh, new controller and now you can vary the ventilation based on outside conditions um, and what's even more important is now we can do ventilation based on your inside conditions using one of the many available indoor air quality sensors are now on the market. And then we can say, what All right, let's talk about this real quick. So why would you want to react to the outside and also your indoor air quality conditions? So if you're looking at the outside here, it looks like they've got temperature, uh, humidity, which if you basically combine the two, you create dew point. Um, and also it looks like you've got uh, outdoor air quality so if you're in an area there's high pollution and it's a bad air day, you want to make sure that that air is coming in. If you are bringing raw air in, you are bringing all those pollutants with it. Um, we always recommend bringing in that outside air through a filter, at least a MERV 13 filter, so you can get those particulates out. Um, but that filter is not going to take out humidity. So if it's, uh, if it's too humid outside compared to the inside conditions, you could be actually bringing moist air in. And uh, while you're getting fresh air, you're getting more oxygen, you're bringing too much moisture in. So these are some of the things that I was looking at for that. Now, again, we do have some solutions uh, with balanced ventilation to address humidity, but it is neat that this kind of system right here can let you know, it's like, hey, I know you're asking for fresh air, but that fresh air really isn't as fresh as you think from the outside. Now, from the inside, it looks like it's got several different sensors that it's looking at. It looks like PM2.5, CO2, and I think earlier I saw them talk about VOCs. Now, PM2.5 is going to come primarily from the kitchen or areas where humans are stirring up dust. Um, the PM2.5 or micro particulates, uh, usually from cooking or say your, your fireplace or something like that. Now, the CO2 is going to basically be from humans. Humans breathe the oxygen, they breathe out CO2. So if you have a party, too many uh, uh, people in one space, you're going to breathe all the oxygen. You, you've, you've heard the expression, people sucking all the oxygen out of the room. Well, that is literal. And this sensor right here can let you know that somebody is sucking the oxygen out of the room. You have too much CO2. So it'll it'll tell the system to adjust for that. And also looking at the VOCs. The VOCs can be from, again, cooking, cleaning, uh, just living in the house, putting on uh uh, the you know cleaning your fingernails with acetone those are all VOCs volatile organic compounds not good for humans to breathe and there's a sensor for that as well so let's uh, look let's learn more about what the system does what would you like to do with it bring on your central fan open a damper and if you're connected to bath fans we can turn them all on um, if you have a CO2 event, well, that may be local, it might be a bedroom, and you've got pockets of clean air in your house, other rooms, living room dens that aren't occupied, all you need to do is bring on the air handler and mix the air in the home up, and now you've got, you've solved your air quality problem without bringing in outside unconditioned air. 
this is one of the things this playing with ventilation you know that's actually a very smart solution now a lot of times when you have that co2 sensor because there are other systems that have the co2 sensors like you know what there's too much carbon dioxide in this particular room we need more oxygen so what we're going to do is bring in oxygen from the outside into the space and basically there's an energy penalty for that so if you're bringing in unconditioned air out and sucking um, you're basically displacing some conditioner at the same time, even with an ERV, an ERV is an efficient way of doing that, but there still is energy consumed with that. Now, if you're able to kind of just like gently mix this up between the different spaces in the house, you, that's another way to bring an oxygen in from a room that you're not necessarily using. Now, I don't know the energy uh, consumption between the, the fan on the air handler versus an ERV. Um, it could be the same. So we just have to look at which way is the most efficient, allow the system to, to react where you can have the clean air, but also not have the energy penalty that comes along with that ventilation. Ventilation components like Legos, and just you need to figure out what you want to do, what impact you want to have, and then just figure out what fans and filters and controls, and the controls are really, really important, and they haven't really existed until this last couple of years to be able to mess with homes because each home is as unique as a fingerprint. Yeah, and once you connect onto the web, the information available is absolutely insane. So for example, if some government study said, well, we can vary the ventilation 10% when the moon is in retrograde after the summer solstice, all right, <laughs> if you want it, we'll write the software. But it gives you an idea. Of hey, the fact that is the cleanest air, like right after the solstice, that's where you get the best air. Actually, he's just making that up because it sounds, sounds pretty cool. But he mentioned something very important. If you look at future proofing your house, uh, there's lots of things that we do to houses, uh, just the way we build them that allows you to adapt over time, um, upgrade over time, uh, you know, where you don't have to, to, to worry about, okay, if this new code comes out or if this new technology comes out, then, I, then, then my house is basically, I have to tear everything out and start over. So it looks like his software, you can do a simple software upgrade where the software is able to control the different devices to meet the ASHRAE codes, meet the energy code, building code, local codes. Cause it basically, when you plug in your zip code, it looks like they're able to know exactly the conditions for that space, outdoor air quality, but also maybe possibly the energy codes as well. Again, that's just speculation. I have to look more into this to see how exactly that works. Uh, how uh, much information, how much control is now at your fingertips for no cost. And the software is super cool, but the hardware is kind of insane. Will you, do you have that chip on you? Jason pulls the chip out of his pocket. That's actually more powerful than the first computer that I had out of college. This is a, uh, a module that is a 32-bit microprocessor with four mega memory. It's got a built-in 802.11n, uh, 150 megabits per second Wi-Fi, a 4.2 uh, blue version Bluetooth, um, half a mega RAM. Um, it, it, the capabilities are absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, we're left uh, with a, an amazing amount of computing horsepower to do th things the scientists may come up with and ask us to do. Not a problem. So we've laid a foundation in hardware that should carry us through a lot of innovations that these other guys come up with. And right now, Jason might only be asking this microprocessor to like turn on and off a fan, which is not very hard. So the, the kind of ceiling on the capabilities of this are endless. This is a temperature, humidity, and actually airflow probe. Uh, it's basically a hot wire anometer. You can't measure temperature humidity right off the bat because the temperature in the duct may be closer to the uh, basement temperature. Or whatever. So we let it run for a couple of minutes to bring in outside air to get uh, a temperature reading. And then we start doing flow, which is great because now you can find out how many CFM is going into your air handler to get the proper ventilation. Now, the really beauty of this is if that CFM starts to uh, drop, that flow drops, we can start to determine that your filter's clogged. So you can set in our app, say, a certain flow rate below that, um, your filter's clogged. And if you'd like, we'll send you a text, send you an email. And as we talk about disasters on season three of home diagnosis, we're obviously also talking about. All right, so let's talk about how that actually is working with the filter and why it's important. Um, when your filter gets clogged, obviously it's not filtering as well. It's not taking the particulates out um, correctly. It's not working as designed. Now filters usually are designed to be changed every 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, a year, depending on the manufacturer. Again, we recommend that four inch pleated filter, cause you get better filtration. It lasts a little bit longer. So when the ones off the shelf, again, are gonna last maybe 90 days at, at the most those one inch filters, and they're not gonna work as, as well. But what this device does is like, say if you're doing something in your house, you're creating a lot of dust, stirring up the dust, or like in my house, I'm always remodeling, maybe possibly doing a drywall patch, but you can clog that filter up. So 
this is sensing a pressure drop to let you know that that filter is clogged. Now I've seen other people say they, they're going to put that on, on their, uh, they're basically going to look at the static pressure difference between one side of the filter and the other. This actually does it. And I think it sends you an alert as well. So let's, let's find out more about how that sensor works and also why it's important. Because remember, if your system has to overcome all that pressure, that all that resistance from the filter, that fan is working harder. When that fan is working harder, that means you are spending more energy to be comfortable and also filter the air. So um, we recommend that you have your fan on such a speed where you're filtering the air like a certain amount of air exchanges per hour just within the house. Now, if that filter is clogged, we're asking you to filter your air, but you're also spending a lot of energy to do that if you have a clogged filter. For something like this, this is very important to let you know that you're gonna be able to save money. Solutions, which is resilience, and this ability to change, to adapt how homes are acting, is incredibly important to that resilience because of course we've got different climate zones, we've got different types of housing, we've got different kinds of occupants and different behaviors. So thank you for keeping on innovating and coming up with new ways to help us tune homes. My pleasure, thank you for teaching people how to tune homes. You know, Cobra brought up a good point and I didn't catch that on the, on the, on the first time around watching this video. So Corbett was talking about resilience and also how humans act in the house. You can have the same house and it's modeled a certain way you can have family A, family B live in the same house, same conditions, same climate. One family can have a higher energy cost, have like more pollutants in the house than family B. It depends on how they live in the house. Now, if you look at the largest source of air pollution in the house, it's not the equipment, it's not the outside, it's not just the house itself off gassing, it's humans inside the house. It's the activities that we're doing inside the house. So having a house that can react to the humans, because Again, when we're designing a building house, we don't know how people are going to live in the house. We can assume just based on how we see our clients through the design process, how they might live in it and try to come up with something for them. But what happens when they sell the house? You need a system that is able to adapt to how they live in the house. Now, I really appreciate Corbett allowing us to use this content to share it with our audience. If you want to learn a bit more about his channel, he's got hundreds of videos on home performance. Um, probably one of the, the best. And he's got a book. He's got a school. Uh, he also has a Patreon page, so if you if you have any questions, you can check out. Just do a search on his channel in the upper right hand corner. Check it out, just his channel. Uh, you can also become a Patreon. So with the Patreon, he'll you can do some one on one uh, sessions, like I'm sorry, a group session, but also get a discount on some of the one on one sessions. Uh, Corbett does work on some of our projects. He does some of the testing, um, and also features some of our projects on his YouTube channel. So. Very smart guy, and I really appreciate all of the uh, information that he brings to this industry. Not enough people are talking about home performance, and the reason is it's very complicated. So the fact that he's uh, explaining this, trying to make it easier for everybody to understand, I really do appreciate that. There's not enough Corbett's out there. Again, go to his channel, subscribe, uh, likes his videos, uh, and, and check out more of his content. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you have any questions about what I was talking about in this video, I tried to explain it uh, the best I could, but ventilation is very complicated. It's ever evolving. And one comment that Corbett made is like over the last two years, we've seen lots of innovations and I expect to see much more innovation over the next two years. So probably like we're in the year 2022 right now, by 2024, we're gonna see some very amazing things with reactive ventilation that's going to make indoor air quality a thing of the past or bad indoor air quality a thing of the past. Thanks again. See you guys next time.